Hello and welcome back to the Anfield Edition podcast. My name is Owen and joining me today we have Ty, so say hello Ty. Hello guys. And we also have Inverter, so say hello mate. Hello. Today will be a slightly longer podcast as we are releasing just the one this week as I'm off to Reading Festival. Anyways, on with the podcast. We'll be looking ahead to a couple of big fixtures against Hoffenheim and Arsenal, our best players against Palace and the Coutinho situation once again. So let's get started. Reflecting on the Palace game, Robertson was the standout performer on his debut, wasn't he? Here's a few stats to summarise his influence. Spending 70% of the match in Palace's half, he showed fantastic attacking ability with 87% pass accuracy, 10 crosses and 3 chances created. It was a thoroughly impressive debut, wasn't it, Ty? Solid, mate. I'm quite impressed with him, to be honest with you. I think um, a lot of people were asking questions when they went. Um, obviously, Marino was starting the league and so on and so on. Um, I kind of expected him to in the Watford game, but then a lot of people were saying, what's the point in bringing Robertson through then? But um, it's just showed, haven't it? We've got a lot of games coming up, and already he's uh, rotated the side. Um, I thought it was a bit early, to be honest with you. Um, I know it's a, f- a fair few games coming up, but I just thought it was a bit early to rotate. But he was solid. It was, it was literally like he's been here for a couple of seasons already, in my opinion. Yeah, it was a seamless transition into the side, wasn't it, Ty? I was really impressed. Exactly, spot on. (laughs) Suspect. Defensively. Yeah. Very, very slight. You can only get better defensively. I think, obviously, we, we we could all see how good he was going forward. His crossing was you know, ridiculously good. And I think um, if our attackers were on their game, or bang on their game, we would have probably added a couple more goals just because of uh, the quality of crosses that are coming in from that left-hand side. Now, Klopp's already rotated the squad quite consistently this season. So, looking ahead to the Hoffenheim and Arsenal games, we've got Milner, Moreno and Robertson all in contention for a starting place in either of those games. So, who would you start for Hoffenheim and who would you start for Arsenal? Um, I reckon I would have comfortably said um, Moreno <laughs> based on... Because um, I think he'd done quite a solid job um, right the way through pre-season. He was up and down in the Watford game. I think he was really good going forward, like we've all said already. But again, he showed like little glimpses of his like lack of concentration and stuff. Um, for me now, the way Robertson f- uh, played against Palace was that good. I would consider putting him in for the Hoffenheim game. I think that's the important one for us at the moment because uh, even though Arsenal is a big game, you know, it's, it's huge. Um, against someone we'll probably be keep competing for for top four. If we didn't get tra- Champions League football. It would be a disaster. So um, I would go for the most solid person in there. And based on the couple of performances we've seen so far, it would be Robertson for me. So who would you start for Arsenal then, Ty? Uh, I don't know if I would rotate. I, I know it was only a couple of days later, but it's early on in the season. If we were like three quarters of the way through or towards the end of the season, I'd say, you know, fair enough, maybe a little bit of rotation is needed. But I think it's too early. You know, they should be quite fresh. Robertson didn't actually go through a grueling, grueling pre-season because obviously Klopp was doing double and triple sessions. So I don't see any reason why he needs to play one or the other. I think he should he could play both if he performs well against Hoffenheim. I think the real issue is the obviously last season we had that big burnout around the Christmas period where the conjunction of fixtures sort of hit us quite hard. So I think he's looking to rotate the squad early just to keep them fresh going into that time. And I think it's probably the right call in my opinion. Um. It- Personally, I think it's quite a good idea because leading up to Christmas, there's a huge congestion of fixtures, and then after Christmas, we can sort of stick to the strongest eleven and push on for the league or whatever position we're at. But up until that point, I think I do think we have to rotate. And out of the two left backs, I'd probably go mm. for Moreno against Hoffenheim, just because I feel as if some of the some of the, uh, the criticism that he got in the first leg. We sort of down to Lovren, I think he was quite poor in that game, and Moreno, is, he's just a scapegoat really. And out of the, the two fixtures, I think Arsenal will be the, the tougher one. I sort of think that there's sort of no way we could now be knocked out yeah. by half a man. So I'd stick with Moreno and potentially put Calavan in the starting eleven, who was very composed on the weekend, I thought. And then Robertson against Arsenal, because I think, I think their right wing is a lot stronger than him, half and hands. So, yeah. And then I'd, 
I don't think Milner's sort of in the left back equation anymore. I think he's just more as like a squad player in in the midfield roles from now on. I think he yeah. done well though, didn't he, Milner, when he came on in um in the middle of the park. I think he made a bit of a difference. Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah. Yeah, Inverter, you've been quite a big critic of Genie Wijnaldum this season. He hasn't had the best start to the season, to be fair to him. Milner, on the other hand, he's much more industrious. Yeah. He'll do the running, like obviously footballers are meant to run, but he'll do the running for you defensively. He's much more um, astute and aware due to his experience. I could really see him pushing uh, Wijnaldum for a place at this point, given how... Uh, slower start it's been for him to the start of the season yeah. given you know how he's more solid defensively yeah definitely going off this season yeah. I mean, well we shouldn't really give one out too much criticism too early on in the season but thus for so far yeah. I do think Milner has shown the better displays overall and one out looks as though he has to train a bit more with the squad and work, work on his just overall game really but it's a strange one with uh, with Milner because he's he's a player who's been playing right mid for most of his career, and now he's come to Liverpool. He's been playing left back, centre mid, and yeah. he's doing great in my opinion. And he always gives his best. So I don't see him. Yeah, hundred percent. I think to be fair, the um, what I would say in uh, Wayne Adams' defence, he seems to be the player out of um, the rest of the midfield three or four, if you include uh, Milner in there as well. That's been experimented with the most in pre-season. Like he was used in an advanced role sometimes. He was like the number mm-hmm. six as well. So I think the you know Klopp's tried to have a look at Wijnaldum or what kind of role he could play. So maybe that's gone against him a little bit as well because he's been here, there, and everywhere preseason. I think the problem is that Coutinho needs to come back into the midfield. And I know yeah. he hasn't really played yeah Lallana. It maybe maybe the criticism has been directed at Wijnaldum unnecessarily because. He sort of needs them other players to complement him as well and let him strive yeah. in a sort of free role where he doesn't he doesn't really do defending or attacking, he just helps out everyone. Whereas now yeah. he's sort of relied to do most of the attacking work because Henderson being a DM and Chan, although he pushes forward, he doesn't always display well offensively. So maybe maybe it's a bit bit of too much pressure is being put on Martin Aldum at the moment and the front yeah, three are struggling, probably. which is why it looks so lethargic in general probably. I think they're just all too similar, aren't they? And they're yeah. very, um, you know, well, with uh, the exception of the odd pass, like which will Henderson will spray. There's just far too many sideways and backwards passes when you've got Henderson, um, Chan, and Wijnaldum in there. There's like just not enough going forward from there. I think we did lack a lot of creativity in the first couple of games that we've seen. And yeah, like you said, anyway, already if Coutinho comes back in, there, it's a different story, obviously. A frustrating sign with Wijnaldum that's been quite prevalent since his career is like the he's almost afraid to shoot sometimes. I know on the weekend again. He had an open goal against Palace, but he decided to take a touch and then the mm. defenders sort of ran, ran in front of him and got blocked eventually. And I feel as if someone like Coutinho just snaps upon a chance like that and finishes it straight away, which yeah. is why we need him, definitely. So, in the similar vein to Robertson, who had a very strong performance, I think Mane was another contester for Man of the Match. He was ever-present again. The progress he's made since joining us is simply incredible, isn't it? Given how inconsistent he was at Southampton, now he's one of our most consistent players. I'll echo Jamie Carragher's comments in saying he is now more important to us than Coutinho is. So, how good was uh, Mane against Palace, lads? And do you think you know he's going to be up there for Player of the Season again? Yeah. Um, go on, go on, there. You go. Awesome. Um, well, yeah, obviously he was player of the year for Liverpool and he was also in the PFA team of the year. So that suggests that he is our best player. And for a winger, I think he's brilliant. But a winger can only affect a game so much normally. However, at Liverpool, I think, because the front three sort of interchange so much, he can sort of affect the game much much more because at times you find him in a centre forward position. So that's maybe why it's different and why why a winger in this scenario can affect the game more than a striker or a centre attack and midfielder. And stats yeah. also show that Liverpool sort of win more games with Mane. I think there's actually a ten percent um difference between I think it's like forty five percent of games that we win with Mane and then thirty five with Coutinho. So again that suggests that Mane mm-hmm. Is more important, but personally, I think I think they're on par, and especially with Coutinho, who's probably going to be playing in the centre mid role. He's going to be more integral to sort of everything that we do. Everything that we play will go through Coutinho, Coutinho first, and he'll sort of spray, spray further. 
Yeah, it was a bit of a funny one, wasn't it? Because obviously when Marnie was initially linked with us and that we seen the fee straight away, like thirty-four plus million pounds, and you know, people, a lot of people were questioning it and everything. And uh, fast forward, like literally towards the end of the season, and we were started worrying. Then when he got that injury, like how you know, if we if we even going to still qualify for the top four? So um, he's definitely coming and made a huge impact straight away. Um, his pace is electric. We all know that already. We need, I think when we had teams that sat back against us, we needed someone who was that quick and that direct, willing to go past the man. Um, and he seems to do it with ease as well. So, um, yeah, he's been huge for us. And uh, definitely um, he'll play a big part again going forward this season if he can stay injury-free. Yeah, it's something that we've needed. I mean, since um, Sterling left and Sturridge has almost lost his pace. So he, he, yeah. he does have that different dimension that Liverpool fans have desired for a while now. That ability to penetrate from out wide and cut in, put, put a few balls in, crosses, so on. So yeah, he, mm. he's, he's definitely a great, it's been a great addition despite many fans just questioning. Just to regain his um, sharpness really quickly, didn't he? Because we've seen him in, like, in pre-season, you, we've seen like, the, a few like, bad touches from him, he was overrunning the ball a bit. And then, literally, as soon as the Premier League side, it was like, bang, he was ready to go. Yeah, wasn't well, he meant to be um, unfair for the Palace game as well? And then, yeah, he, exactly. he started so. and looked like the best player on the pitch, so that's, that tells I you know. everything, isn't it? Yeah. Real bad back there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. With that 1-0 win, Atnacone asks, are we finally over our bogey team? And I would say yes, with the ball at the helm, but that's not the same Palace we played the last few seasons. One that used to be quite physical and robust in defence, and now chose possession and flair. What did you think of Palace, lads? Um, I think they all struggle a little bit, just to um, only initially maybe at first, because um, they've got to adapt now to a whole new way of uh, playing under the ball. He obviously wants him to play football. He wants him to play out the back, and we didn't really see that a lot from um, from them over the past couple of seasons. It was kind of get it to their winger as quickly as possible, get it up to their front man. You know, obviously Benteke has been that person as quickly as possible, and then play off that. And obviously against those kind of teams, that's where we struggled. You know, we seemed to shit ourselves every time we had a set piece against us, didn't we? A corner, a free kick. You just always panicked for some reason. Uh, so yeah, I don't know. Um, I, Probably a little bit too early to say. I don't know if um, we're definitely over it yet because we've only seen one game against them. But I think time will tell as the season goes on when we see them how they fare against other teams as well. Because they were kind of a bogey team for a lot of play uh, for a lot of teams, weren't they last year? Yeah, I did a big mistake against Liverpool. Yeah, I thought the tactics were strange from the bow. He's almost like trying to apply his philosophy to what he thinks is a Barcelona team, but in reality, he's got a midfield that consists of Loftus Cheek and Mil- Milijevic. So, <laughs> I do think that the squad have to play with, with each other a bit more. Maybe once the chemistry gets going, they'll start to play better. Yeah. But at the moment, surely he's looking like one of the favourites to get sacked first because because this philosophy that's sort of right, he, the since he's obviously what he done at Ajax he, mm. you know he was praised there and everything and then as soon as he's come out of that job and it just hasn't worked out for him so far now De Boer tried to make that transition to Italian <laughs> football from Ajax where he started his uh, coaching career much more successful at Ajax actually when he played mm. a more defensive style of uh, football uh, surprisingly what would happen is because they were mostly underdog teams uh, the underdog in Europe when they were playing these big teams uh, I feel like he should adopt the same approach with Palace I, he's going to try and play this expansive possession based football without the players to deploy the system I know there was one moment where there was two like corners in quick succession both taken short and you think what on earth are you thinking De Boer, when you've got Benteke up front who can get on the end of those crosses oh. against a team that's notoriously bad at defending set pieces I mean it just didn't add up for me mm-hmm. yeah. there's possession oh, football and away from the Premier League just like out of interest I think Arsenal sort of try and play possession football but it's, it's sort of unsuited to the league isn't it like the the Premier League is more counter attacking. Either you're either counter attacking on the back foot or you just it's peppering the goal with shot, aren't it? So it's yeah. going to be interesting to see how that progresses. 
So we are now one step away from Champions League qualification. We have the two away goals in the bag and I expect us to see the tie through. However, Hoffenheim still posed a threat and the goal was an example of that. The defence switched off for a second. I believe it was Alexander-Arnold with his hand up, yeah. wasn't it? And they then scored off of that. Add to the missed penalty in the first half. It won't be easy on Wednesday, will it, Ty? No, mate. Like I said, we, we know now what they're all about. Um, obviously, you've done a little bit of research beforehand, didn't I? So, um, kind of knew what to expect in terms of the way they set up and everything. But, um, yeah, they were a threat. They were a threat from all over the pitch as well. Um, they were quicker than I expected them to be, both um, offensively and defensively as well. Um, we've seen it on the occasion that Salah went through. I think um, a couple of their setting backs in particular were very quick and didn't seem to get blown away by um, the pace that we had up front. Um, I think their manager came out recently in their press conference um, earlier today and they said that they cope very well with our speed and attack. Um, so yeah, they're going to be dangerous um, the other, going the other way as well. So I think we'll have to be um, bang on our game defensively. We need to be better than we were in the first leg, for sure. Um, I think... Um, do you think Lovren is going to keep his place with how uh, solid Clavin was? I think he's a broom too, but I don't necessarily agree with that after Clavin's display. But again, was that influenced by Robertson yeah. being there? Potentially, yeah. Now, Hoffenheim, as we know, they were very good in that first half. Um, we easily could have been 2-0 yeah. down, I feel. The amount of chances they had as well. Uh, Mignolet really kept us in that one. The missed penalty, of course, very touched on. Uh, but yeah, it's definitely going to be a tough game on Wednesday, isn't it? Yeah, well, they had a chance right at the end of the game as well, didn't they? A free header, which they really should have scored, to be honest with you. So if if they had scored, yeah. if we if we come out of that game at 2-all or even lost 3-2, we couldn't have had that many complaints, to be honest with you because they, they did create some real clear-cut chances. So to an extent, I think we were lucky that we come away with a 2-1 win. Yeah, looking back at the game, we were really lucky. I thought we just snake Serge Gnabry. He mm. created a lot of chances, but then sort of failed to capitalise in the final stages. Again, Vought had an open header. Um, they had an open header in the 93rd minute, as you just said, Ty. The penalty, obviously, I mean, the game could have ended 5-2 very easily, so... I do sort of feel as if we're actually underestimating them a bit. We'll come back in yeah. hindsight. I think we'll be strong at home. I think um, we're always stronger yeah. at Anfield on a European night. Um, we've seen it many times. Obviously, I think we've touched on it in a previous pod, like against Man United, strong. Against Dortmund, strong. So um, we tend to do better at home. So I think that'll kind of uh, see us through, to be honest with you. Um, we've learned a little bit yeah, more about Hoffenheim yeah. now as well. You know, there's obviously Klopp had a knowledge of them, but being under uh, Nagelsmann as well going forward. Um, you've seen them up front and up close and personal, so I think you'll have a better game plan this time round. Yeah, it's also important to mention the, the Anfield atmosphere. Obviously, the cop will be in full voice. So even if we do go down, I mean, someone who goes to match squad is not myself. We can we can go down and then we we start comebacks. It's, it's happened, yeah. you know, a lot before. So we we sort of got that to fall back on if we do yeah. go down early. Now the twelfth think... man is something that's really underrated. Yeah. Um, I feel at least by other fans. I know us Liverpool mm. fans. We really appreciate how important that is to our team getting a good performance and you know mounting those comebacks that we've so famously done in the past. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. I think. Um, if we score first and if we score early, I think we win the game comfortably. Um, if it's one of those games where, yeah. you know, Hoffenheim can be very patient as well. They won't go all out attack, obviously. If they do decide to sit back and frustrate us, it will get a little bit nervy. So I think the key for us will be to kind of uh, score early, if we can. Yeah, I just think we'll set up, we'll be set up defensively from the very start, so we'll try to play football. Mm. Yeah, it'll be a very intriguing tie, um, it has to be said. Um, Hoffenheim do pose quite a big threat to us like we've already touched on uh, as in regards to a prediction let's get one out of you nobody was on the money last week as none of us went with a clean sheet <laughs> against Palace uh, obviously Ty famously on the first day predicted a clean sheet against Watford we conceded yeah, no, three no. uh, so go ahead for this match what is your prediction for our Champions League tie with Hoffenheim um, I'm going to say we'll be solid at home um, I'm gonna, <laughs> I'm gonna try and back a clean sheet again this this time. So I'm gonna go a two nil home win. 
Yeah, that's a pretty good prediction. I'd like to see that happen. Inverter, what about your prediction? I'm going to go for 1 0 early goal and sort of just keep our composure and see the game out, hopefully. See, I'm going with quite a risky prediction. I've gone for a 0 0. It's going to be absolutely horrible to watch, I can tell you that now. We'll be forced to sort of hold mm. on to the previous result. Uh, it'll make a really nerve wracking watch, but we'll get into the group stage nonetheless. Yeah. Next, let's look at Coutinho o'clock. The club <laughs> refused to change their stance on Coutinho by 7 o'clock on Sunday as the third bid of 118 million was rejected and the add-ons pretty much made it a joke of an offer anyway. There was no way the club was ever going to accept that bid, was there, Ty? No, don't be silly. Um, I think it was... I, th I just thought it was hilarious that them actually put in um, a deadline on it when we've already rejected it. We rejected it um, instantly and then they came back if they'd come back and said, right, here's 130 million, then here's the deadline, then it might make people sit up and take notice. But the fact that we've already rejected their bid and then they said, you've got until 7 o'clock to change your mind. <laughs> Literally just, it was, it was like banter. Literally banter. Um, the actual <laughs> makeup of the bid was a joke as well. Um, I don't know how, um, how many people actually knew, knew much of, a, of it. So 118 million, apparently about 82, 83 of it was up front with 30 odd million obviously in um, add-ons did you know what some of the add-ons included yeah I, I, uh, Ballon yeah. Ballon, wasn't it? continue yeah. winning the Ballon d'Or um, multiple <laughs> Champions League wins apparently the multiple, multiple Champions League joke, wins I swear. and multiple trophies because you know how bad Barca have been know. you know how Barca have been oh it was a joke yeah. I laughed when I saw that. I full on laughed. The thing is, right? Um, <laughs> I think if we had a better transfer window, I think obviously you know Carragher has said it himself. If we had a better transfer window, I think there's a, a huge possibility you would have gone. If we did already have you know Van Dijk, Keita in the bag, and maybe looking at or getting closer to bringing someone in to cover for Lallana, we probably would have accepted it. Anything between 100, yeah. 110, 130 million, we would have accepted it. Obviously, maybe not so much with the add-ons that they, they offered, but if they would come to us and said, right, here's perhaps you know, 90 to 100 million up front and then kind of another 20 million in guaranteed money may spread across the next year or two, probably would have happened. But um, yeah, with the transfer window going like really, really bad for us so far, it was, it was no chance we were going to let him go. We would have looked ridiculous. Yeah, certainly. Um, there was no, I think there's no way on earth they would let him go. Uh, at this point anyway, uh, even if we had brought in the players, I can't have seen them like losing such a pivotal player at this point in the season. I think we're all still a bit annoyed um, about the timing, obviously, of it. Looking more at Coutinho setting, you know, that now that he's set to remain a Liverpool player, can you see him being brought back into the team like in the same vein or is it going to be a bit of a, you know, a rocky start for him when he gets back to Anfield? Um. Absolutely not. I think things like this happen. It's happened before. And an example being Bruni and his sort of contract standoff with United demanding the 200 grand, which is really a lot of money at the time. And he was threatening the city move and so on. And eventually the relationship with the United fan base just came back naturally. Once he comes back, starts scoring from 30 yards, we'll love him again, without a doubt. And um, it's also important to note that allegedly he was ill advised by Barca representatives and apparently they got his family to manipulate mm -hmm. him. And obviously we don't know the truth, but we've also got to take that into consideration because maybe it wasn't actually Coutinho. It was all just me media stuff and just Barcelona trying to cause chaos in the club and causing a, a panic sell almost. So, um, yeah, Coutinho allegedly being ill now probably just bollocks yeah of course really, it is it's it? just time mm -hmm. for him to get his head right in it at the end of the day um, yeah Pierce said he's meant to be coming back after yeah. the international break so I think that's what's going to happen really yeah and then he'll just ease him back into I the think it's just uh, there's yeah. two ways you look at it really I think you're obviously with the timing like you said already it was you know horrible timing just, uh, before we started our Premier League season you're going to have the initial fume because obviously, you know, he's our most, one of our most talented players, you know, handing a transfer request after, well, a few months ago, back in January, saying how much he loved the club and he wanted to be a legend, etc., etc. So obviously you're going to have that few initially. But I think it's, it's obviously hard for a lot of people, but putting yourself in a player's position, when a club like Barcelona come along, OK, from an outside view, we're looking at them at the moment and saying, yeah, they're in decline. 
you know, Alves have said, you know, a lot of players wanted to leave. Neymar's come out and said the similar kind of thing. A lot of players are unhappy. There's rumours of Messi being unhappy. But when a club of Barcelona's size come in for you and they're telling you this is, you know, is either now or, is now or never, um, if we don't get you, we'll bring someone else in. You're going to panic as a player. You know, you're about to enter your prime. You're about to enter your best years. So I, I, I get it. I, I, I do get it. You know, they'll double, triple his wages or whatever. They'll offer him a stupid amount of money. This, he's a South American player. He's going to want to play in Barcelona. So I, I get it. I know I can see why his head was turned. But I just think the best thing for him to do is just keep his mouth shut. Even if he wanted the move, just keep it all private. You, they, you don't need to hand in a transfer request. I, don't, I just don't think it really does a lot. Because if a club, um, which you've just dedicated, committed to for the next five years, the, the club haven't got to sell you. I, I, I don't understand why players think... How, if they agitate for a move, that they'll just let them go easily, especially with this stupid offer coming through. If it was mixed in, right, if he kept his mouth shut, we had a good transfer window, and Barcelona offered a decent amount of money up front, probably would have happened. But he's just made his life a little bit harder now, because obviously he's going to have fans at first on his back. They'll come back on side as soon as he puts you know a, a worldie in there, top bin from 30 yards, every, everything will be forgiven, you know. <laughs> but is, yeah. you've got to see it from both sides. You've got to, be, you've got to like, kind of like rein it back a little bit and see it from a human point of view. That why you would have wanted to go. It's obviously quite clear, isn't it? It's Barcelona at the end of the day. There's only two clubs in the world, which, well, a couple clubs in the world, which is more of a stepping stone from Liverpool in terms of how big the club is. Not out as we are as a team now, because, you know, we're not in the Champions League yeah. year in, year out. But as a club, there's not many teams bigger than Liverpool. Yeah, I think the biggest issue will be with Klopp, because he's known to sort of hold grudges with players and allegedly. He agreed to stay at the club a few weeks prior to the whole incident, so that'll definitely piss him off. 100%. It'll be interesting to see what happens, but I think he's too good of a player to just sit on the sidelines, really, and he, he's left with no choice, especially from the owners as well. Yeah. Just, just to play him eventually. Because you've got a lot of fans, um, I saw, especially on Twitter at least, saying, I'll oh, just let him rot in the stands, and I think it's not the right thing for the club to execute something like that I mean first of all you're making the squad thinner you're one player short from a very you know basic point of view but then we're forgetting that one player is Coutinho and how important he has been too good. to us for the past few yeah. years he's too good to pass up while he's here we all know he's going to leave eventually like we all expect it uh, to happen so while he's here you may as well you know let him have that platform to thrive and you know the better he plays the more money you get out of him realistically of that's the that's the way that's it is. Exactly the same situation. More importantly, I don't think the owners would allow it surely because if if they just yeah. rejected the hundred and eighteen million or whatever it was, they're not then gonna say yeah, do whatever you want with them, Klopp. If if you want to just let them sit on the stands, then I can't see that happening. We've seen it. We've seen exactly the same thing happen with Suarez. You've seen obviously people saying that you know let Suarez rot in the stands is never gonna happen. He's our best player by a mile, and he came and had like the best season of his Liverpool career, I think. So. You know, he, he, he nearly shot us to the league as well. So if Coutinho does something similar and we go one step further, no one's going to be complaining if he does eventually go to the new camp. Yeah, absolutely. Not. Yeah, so with Coutinho set to stay, uh, I mean, the clock doesn't need to bring in necessarily Draxler, uh, as a lot of people are reporting. Uh, James Pearce dismissed uh, our interest in Draxler a bit earlier on this week. But Klopp still supposedly wants to pursue a, mid, uh, a central midfielder. Now, Draxler isn't the answer, according to Klopp, which I find quite ludicrous. Um, Coutinho often operates in the space between midfield and attack. The same as Draxler does or has done for Wolfsburg and PSG. And the need for creativity in that midfield is completely obvious to everyone. All the numbers are up for us fans. Is Klopp seeing some in We Aren't? Or... <laughs> Brilliant one for me, isn't it? Because I've literally just done a, an article on Draxon, how well he would fit him. Yeah. <laughs> and then, uh, <laughs> good news, James Pierce comes in and uh, says we're definitely not interested in him. Loving that. Great timing. Cheers, James. <laughs> um, I, I like Draxler. Um, the only thing which threw it into doubt was the fact that, you know, that whole um, dispute come out, whether Draxler used Liverpool to get more money out of PSG and so on and so on. Um, obviously the timing of it as well Klopp come out and said um, I only want players who want to play for Liverpool so you don't know if that was a bit of a dig at players kind of asking for money and making that their priority um, I'd like to see him all the, all the same I'd like to see him like you just said he, he's a great link between midfield and attack 
he can operate out wide if we did get any injuries or suspensions. He's fairly quick. He's got you know, he's brilliant two feet as well, and he can score a goal. Um, I'd love to see him here, but I can't understand why Klopp wouldn't be interested. I don't know if any of you two can. Can they? I can sort of see where he's coming from due to the system that's in place. Obviously, he can't play on the left because our best player plays yeah. there. He can't really play centre mid because he's not really suited that role. We told him have to play with a cam or a second striker. So that might be the problem they see. And that alongside the January stuff, maybe that's ultimately what led, led him to just pass upon the opportunity to yeah. sign him. Mind you, I can see where he'd sit into midfield. We've always had that Lalana Coutinho sort of archetype to midfielder uh, that does press up to that attack, and it, it creates the link, obviously, between them. It's I think people often think of formations too rigidly, like the players stay to that position, which is not the case, obviously, for Klopp's Liverpool, where we've got the front three constantly interchanging. Yeah. That happens in the midfield as well. It often goes unnoticed. Obviously, you have Henderson dropping into the defence, a lot of the time to pick up the ball, receive the ball and pass out wide. Those midfielders push up a lot more than people realise. And I think Draxler as a type in there, Coutinho, Lalana, that position, that's one where you have to go forward. And Draxler isn't obviously an out-and-out -out central midfielder. He's not a box-to-box -box type like Emre Chan. He is that creative spark in that midfield. Yeah. And I think he would really suit us for that position, pushing forward onto the, the front three and sort of getting in the box on the tanks. Mm. Yeah, the sort of problem I foresee with that is that Coutinho is that player. Yeah. And you can't have a midfield three with two attacking midfielders. That, yeah. That's just not going to work. Yeah. You need a Coutinho and then you need a Lallana who plays a bit deeper than Coutinho and presses. And then you need your Henderson who's totally deep yeah, and sort of protects the defence. Yeah. Realistically, so that's, yeah. That's why that wouldn't happen. So currently the problem for Draxler is that he's not getting minutes. So he's not going to then come to Liverpool and then Klopp's going to say, yeah, when Lallana's fit, you're out the team. So yeah. he's probably going to want a guarantee at his next club, which is, again, another problem. Mm. We, can, we can't guarantee him a start, start every single game. It's all about building up depth, though, isn't it? Without going out and getting these key players, yeah. when you go out and get injuries, you're left stranded in that midfield. I feel with Lana's loss especially, I feel like we've been missing something there. So it's, it's more that we do need the depth, and it's where the players obviously are willing to accept a part-time role. And the best players aren't simply going to accept that. Yeah. So it's going out and getting second grade players and then hoping they come good when they appear in the team. And it's it's not always the best model uh, for the club. Obviously, the top clubs like United, especially this season, you see they've got Marshall on the bench. They can afford to do that. With Liverpool, it isn't the same, I feel. Yeah. Yeah, unfortunately not. We, we just can't compete with them financially. And as you said, a player of Drax's nature and how big of a player he really is. He's not going to come in and play part time and be a rotation player. We can go after either something just lower than Draxler. I mean, I, I can't think of any examples, but I suppose that's what the scouting team is for. Yeah, it's frustrating though, isn't it? Like I said, when you're seeing kind of Man United with the kind of players they got on their bench, and obviously the obvious one is Man City, and <laughs> you know, when they, when, when they could bring on the likes of Sterling, um, Sane, and players like that off their bench, I just. It's a little bit disheartening, that's all, when we've got to look at players a little bit lower than the calibre of Kessler, when he would be great to bring off the bench, for example, or to rotate in if you did want to give Mane or Salah a rest and so on. So I think that's where I can see where Owen's coming from in terms of the depth. You, want to have, you, do, you, want to, you don't want to just have depth for depth's sake. Yeah, you want to have quality coming off the bench, a match winner coming off the bench. Because I just think, like you said, apart from when we've got a fully fit squad, great, you've got storage on the bench and then maybe someone like Solanke if he comes good, good or whatever but we have a, a lack of match winners and especially with Sturridge now as well who's not the player he was like a couple, two seasons ago um, and then at the same time taking what Inverter just said as well is going to look at our side and say right my direct competition if I'm going to play on the left is going to be like Mane or Salah if they interchange or whatever and then if I want to play in an attacking midfield role my my uh Competition is Coutinho, so it is a bit of a tough one. So I could see why Klopp would kind of pass up on that option yeah. as well. But I would still love him at the same time. Yeah. Yeah, completely. Even agree. if we didn't want him, surely Draxler would not want us because of this problem. So yeah, maybe they're taking that into account. Then. Catch twenty two. Kind of got a forum, and he'll just refuse refuse to join us again. It's going to mm. be quite disheartening for the fans. So maybe they just yeah, definitely looking away straight away.
I mean, I'm seeing reports um, from the Mirror, actually, that we were in a verbal agreement with Matteo Kovacic, the guy that uh, obviously was the standout wonder kid in Europe uh, for Inter, sort of moved to Real Madrid, didn't get much game time. They've obviously got quite a few different midfielders. They'd be willing to sell, even though they don't have to. Uh, where do you see him? I mean, if he, he came into the side, I don't know how much you've seen of him, possibly, but he's more of a box-to-box -box type. Do you think that's more what Klopp's after when he says a central midfielder? Yeah, I think that down, down to a tee. I do think he, he's a great player. Um, he suits us much more than the Draxler. And I think when Vitt was saying how you know attacking um, Draxler is, I think Kovacic is going to be more that like deep lane play deep line playmaker. He, you know, he can he's got great vision. He's got a good pass on him. He's very neat and tidy on the ball. He's composed. I just think if you're when you got the likes at the moment, for example, of Hendo. Chan Wijnaldum, you could put Kovacic in there, and you know he will create openings for like you know the front three. Whereas Hendo and the other two are very very sideways, well far too often. So I think yeah, Kovacic is probably more suited to the midfielder we would be looking for, in my opinion, from what I've seen of him anyway. Probably Invert might know a little bit more about him than me though. Yeah, also the players we've got currently, I think he's sort of a genie type player, but I think he's a lot better because. He's sort of like Modric mm. in terms of style. He does like to drop deep, he can defend, but he's also got the, um, the vision to sort of create chances for us, which is what I think Wayne Adam struggles yeah. to do at times. So that's why I think it'd be, it'd, be, it'd be a sublime addition, to be honest. But allegedly, they've had a 70 million euro offer, which they rejected. So again, can who, we, who was that from? Can we layer him with the financial pa package? I think it was. Um, Struggle to remember. It wasn't, it wasn't Juve, was it? Because they just got Matuidi. I thought it was Juve for some reason. Yeah, I'm, I'm trying to think. Might have been Juve. I've got a feeling it was actually ah, AC yeah, okay. or Juve. Yeah, I think they sort of got the money. But again, Real Madrid don't have to sell. And they've sort of got the direct replacement for Luka Modric because he's, he's aging, obviously. Yeah. He's 30. And in terms of style, I don't think it gets any closer to I wouldn't be surprised yeah. if um, it was one of those... Both Croatian as Yeah, well. I wouldn't be surprised if, if they did get yeah. rid of Kovacic. It would be one of those buyback options like they did with Morata. Yeah, mm. exactly. So. Yeah, so we'd have him for like two seasons. He'd come good, they'd rob him. Yeah, that's... Simple yeah. As. <laughs> it's the worst type, of, worst type of transfer because they're basically saying, if he's shit, you're going to have him. If he's yeah. good, we'll have him back. <laughs> <laughs> so now Arsenal uh, we won on both occasions last season scoring 7 goals in 2 games our attack was just simply class uh, we ne will need them firing on all cylinders this Sunday with the game in midweek to contest with also we may not go full strength this weekend what changes might we see from our best XI would Sturridge come in maybe a Rigi how about Moreno as well uh, what do you think Inverter I don't think we'll rest too many of the players because obviously Arsenal are an incredible side, especially from what I've seen against Leicester. Defensively, they've got issues, but when they go forward with their sort of class up front, especially with the addition of Lacazette, we certainly can't underestimate them. How it changes, I do say, is Sturridge maybe coming back into the team, getting an hour of football, then maybe Solanke coming on off the bench, who I'd really like to see get some minutes because he has this new dimension. So with Mane and Salah still on the pitch, I think he'd be great due to their crossing abilities. And obviously, if Robertson plays against Hoffenheim, I think Moreno will play on the weekend and vice versa. But other than that, maybe Lovren and Clavan, maybe they'll interchange between the midweek game and the weekend game. But I do think Klopp knows that he has to go all out in this game. And it's always a cracker. It's always goals, isn't it? Isn't it? Always yeah. goals. I was, um, I was at the game, actually, when we smashed them. I th was it 5-1 a couple of seasons back? That was a good yeah. one. <laughs> And yeah. that was storage when it absolutely on fire that game. I mean, I'd love to see a performance like that again. Yeah, it was like well, that's the first time. Um, I'm not. I'm not a huge drinker, obviously, because of the job I'm in. But um, that was the first time I, I drank a few pints before the game. I was absolutely steaming. <laughs> it doesn't. It doesn't take a lot to get drunk anyway. <laughs> but um, oh, anyway, for any for any kids <laughs> out there, I'm not advocating drinking. Okay, it's very bad. <laughs> um, but yeah, it was absolutely steaming, and literally, like it was such a blur because it was obviously one goal after the other one. The first three was just like bam, 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 and um, atmosphere was electric. I love playing the um, Arsenal games. I love it. So um, I wouldn't want to see us rest too many players. Not this early on in the season, anyway. Like I've already said earlier on, 
Um, maybe one or two changes um, yeah. with the way Arsenal play as well. They got obviously they got that they played that what the three five two now or three four three or whatever it is. Mm-hmm. Um, they switch the ball quite a lot from flank to flank. So I think um, defensively, I'd probably want to see Robertson in there, just due to Moreno's positioning. Really, um, they they like a, a switch of the play. They move the ball around very quickly. Arsenal. So I think um, much prefer to see Robertson um, at the back. Just literally, like I just said, out. Um, just positioning wise but uh, Sturridge um, he's had a good few games against Arsenal in the last few years as well so wouldn't mind if he did come into the team but I think we need to be busy against their um, like Inverter just said didn't he they're quite suspect defensively still already we've seen it against Leicester seen it against Stoke um, so Firmino is, it will be huge in that game against Arsenal I think yeah Ty you said you'd start Robertson midweek yeah. as well so do you sort of see him as the first choice player now sort of completely taking um, away off the equation which I'd yeah, sort of I, I, I think so but obviously I, I don't want to get too excited as well because it is a big step up for Robertson um, he did perform really well he had a good pre-season I think um, and he followed it up with a really really good game man of the match performance in my opinion him and Ma- Mane were on a par um, against Palace but um, if he follows this up if he did play against Hoffenheim and he was solid again I would definitely give him a chance at least because even though I do like Moreno I do really like him I think he's a brilliant character and I think I got really excited when I seen him in the um, Bayern Munich game because it was against one of the best clubs in the world. I know he was a friendly, but he was solid. He was really good defensively. He seemed to be really switched on. And going forward, he was phenomenal. Um, pace, he, was, you know, he linked up well with the attack as well. And um, yeah, but for me, defensively, that's where Marino is suspect. So if Robertson comes in and proves that he's solid at the back and he, we've seen how good he is going forward equally... Um, equally as good as Moreno, then it would be hard not to give him a chance, wouldn't it, as first choice? Yeah, certainly. Uh, Arsenal suffered a disappointing loss to Stoke last Saturday, like you touched on. Uh, despite dominating the game, new signing Hesse scored the device, uh, decisive goal in a 1 0 win. So they'll be looking to bounce back at Anfield, and it will certainly be our tough it, uh, toughest opposition so far this season. Keeping Lacazette quiet will be the hardest task of all, surely. He's good. We've seen what he can do already. You know that um, header against Ars- against Leicester, really, very, really, really sharp in the box. Um, he's just one of those players that can make something out of nothing, as well. Um, he's not a type of player who's going to like go in and beat two or three, four players. But in the box, he's so, so sharp. He's always first to the ball. Is a, f- a touch and hit. So um, often he takes a defender, goalkeeper by surprise. So yeah, um, Lovren or whoever is at the back will need to be. Uh, very alert to a Lacazette's movement. Sanchez won't be in. Um, he's got a more long-term injury. Uh, Ozil, I'm not sure about. Uh, I'm trying to think if there's anyone else. Obviously, Jack Wilshere is still injured, <laughs> so he won't be in the fold. At Fighting all. one, he um, midweek. He actually, he he did punch someone. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Just he did punch someone. Um, no, but I think the. The back three, uh, I'm not sure if Koscielny's... Is Koscielny back in yet or no? Because obviously he had that ban, didn't he? Mm. From the start, at the end of last season. So he might actually be back in for this one. Uh, I know they'll have Monreal and Kolasinic in the uh, back three as well. So it might be that we see that sort of combination at the back. If Koscielny's back from his ban, I haven't got all obviously the details on that. But I, I, I feel like it could be this game. Oh, okay. Yeah. It's more just you never know what you're going to get with Arsenal. Like you don't know which Arsenal team's going to turn yeah. up. That's the real issue I feel because they easily could have lost to Leicester on the opening day. 100%. They haven't been, you know, they didn't get past Stoke as well. We've got, you know, they haven't got the best defensive record. They've had quite a few four 0 losses last season off the big yeah, teams. Yeah, they seem to get bullied by Stoke it's, every season. Though, don't they? To be fair, that's I think that's yeah, kind of one of their bogey teams mm-hmm. as well. Yeah, I think that is their their main one. I think Stoke. Um, well, they haven't won at uh, Stokes Ground for seven years or something. <laughs> so I, I remember reading that stat um, up at the weekend. But no, that is one of their bogey teams. But obviously, we've already touched on the fact that it's always a gold fest when it comes to Arsenal and Liverpool recently. Yeah. We've had 4-3, 3-0, 5-1. I mean, you, we can't see the game going any other way, surely, at the weekend. Yeah, I tell you what, I think um, Giroud's going to be a big danger man again. I remember a few seasons ago, a few seasons ago I was at the game and... It was 3-3, it was sort of the first wow moments for me and Oad with, with his brace. 
but Giroud also done like really well in that game with the mm. brace of his own, and he, he really is one of the best target men in the world. Really, like when he's playing at his best, and they might just stick him on in like the last minutes of the game, and you know, with our defenders, we'll have to really like watch out for him. Get some corners in. <laughs> you just see it coming. It'd be interesting <laughs> to see how um, remember, yeah. how um, Chamberlain plays because he was uh, he looked sharp as well. He's looked one of the best yeah. players so far. Yeah, he looked great against Leicester from from yeah. what I saw. Made mm. me really want him actually. So yeah, like of the players we were talking about before, I think Oxley Chamberlain is a realistic one who could sort of be that squad player. We've also mentioned it yeah. in podcasts before, and I I sort of think he's that caliber below Draxler, and maybe he'd yeah. be happy to be in that squad role with his with the diversification Just in this game. Keep an eye out for a clock hug with Chamberlain at the end of the game because a lot of players, <laughs> clock goes and hugs and yeah. signing and we've seen him with Mane, haven't we? So. <laughs> yeah, hopefully he scores. We've seen to sign everyone who yeah. scores against us. <laughs> no, well, as long as Jury doesn't score against us, like, God. <laughs> yeah. Just end up with the wall up front. Can you imagine? <laughs> right, so yeah, he's good for Arsenal, but no thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Finally, let's get another prediction out of all of you. I'm back in a three-two win for us. I'll put my faith in the front three once more. And if previous meetings with Arsenal or anything to go by, this is going to be the goal fest, like we said. Uh, what's your thoughts on that, Inverter? Um, I'm going to go for three-one. I sort of, I think without Sanchez, Arsenal won't be able to. Hurt us too much, maybe they'll. I can see them getting the first goal, then sort of, sort of eventually they'll pull easing into the game. Um, two what about you, Ty? 2 1, obviously, to us. Um, I think um, we might, depending on how the game goes midweek, might look, may look a little bit jaded, but at the same time, like I've said, it depends on how, um, how much rotation we actually play in, but. It, it depends. If if we if we exert ourselves a lot midweek, I hope it's not one of those tense games which you think is going to be. Oh, I think if we like go in and get a nice couple mm. of early goals and we can rest a couple of players, like you know maybe give them twenty thirty minutes rest before the end, that'll be perfect for us because um, I think we can go yeah. a little bit more full throttle against Arsenal then. So, but yeah, I'm, I'm, I, won't, I won't back a clean sheet against Arsenal. Um, never happens. So I'll go uh, <laughs> two one. Yeah, so I mean that's sorted now. Um, I think as well what you touched on as well talking about the rotation um, that we could see against Hoffenheim that's so important getting a good result against Hoffenheim going into this Arsenal match I think it cannot be understated by any means because if you go out if we go out there let's just give this as an example uh, we go out we get a 3-0 you know and it's like you said the 60th minute if we can get that extra half an hour rest out of our best yeah. players especially Mane I would say as long as you can get Mane and Salah a rest maybe Firmino as well you could see them, you know, really blown away that Arsenal defence that really hasn't been anything special so far this season. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, so. yeah, hopefully that does happen. Like, maybe that's what Klopp will do. He'll try and sort of finish the game off in the first half now and sort of put trust in our defence. Maybe stick a defensive midfielder on. So, um, yeah, which will give us more energy. Yeah, I just I don't want to be one of those games where, like, you know, we've... we've okay, I know Arsenal were... They weren't terrible against... Um, Leicester and Stoke, they were very dominant against Stoke, but I just don't want it to be one of those games where they haven't turned up completely against those teams, and obviously, they, of course, they're going to turn it on against uh, Liverpool. Their goalkeeper's going to be man in the match, as always. It always happens, then it, when it comes to us. <laughs> you know, when is our turn? <laughs> but, uh... It's always, it's, it's always Liverpool's turn, though, isn't it? Let's always. be honest. <laughs> I just, I haven't, I just, I just, it's, again, so stressful. I, I, it's, I, I just find it's one of the most difficult teams to support is never an easy ride. We do every yeah. single thing yeah. the hardest way possible. It's like they get a kick out of it. Yeah, yeah. We, we just defy yeah. logic, don't it we? It stresses me. It stresses <laughs> me out. Like, we'll smash the top side. The top sides would then get battered by these awful sides. So, I'll tell you what, like, know, that it, first it, Premier it, League it, weekend it as well, when it came back and we had that 3 3, I was like, I'm, I'm going to have a heart attack this yeah. season. I don't think I'm... I'm, I'm going to get to about the 19th game. We're going to get about halfway through the season. I'm just thinking, can I really put up with this? Like, it's honestly. hard work, isn't it? Hard work. Start yeah. as you mean to go on and all that. 3-3 three, 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 three draw. <laughs> nail bite in away win in, in Europe. And then probably be more drama tomorrow. We'll probably get someone sent off in the first five minutes. Oh, God, don't it's say that. It's though, doesn't it? Like, we, we change players and everything, but we still can't, can't beat these sides. We've got the best players in the world. We just still can't do it. It's almost as if you injected with some sort of thing with a sample <laughs> <of the pool. laughs> Is that part of the the medical when you come here? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, 
Age of Dose of Hormones that makes you lose these <laughs> games. <laughs> Now it's time for your questions. Obviously, you submitted to us on Anfield Edition's Twitter. To kick things off, at Lord Lalana asks, will Klopp manage to get Coutinho back into the squad? And will he let him back in after showing his intentions? Now, we touched on this a bit earlier, but I just wanted to go more into the Sacco situation. It's not too dissimilar. The only real difference is that Klopp chose to exile Sacco and Coutinho sort of brought it upon himself. I feel, obviously, now we can reflect on the injury, the back injury, and now the illness we can see that as, you know, a bit dodgy, something that he's possibly faked, and we know that he's handed in a transfer request mm. of his own accord. I, um, I don't know. I, personally, for me, uh, I think the only way back for him is a public apology, sort of in the same vein as Suarez did a few years back. Uh, what do you think, Ty? Um, it's a funny one, because, yeah, same as what you just said, Then I've seen a lot of people on Twitter saying that um, if he uh, welcomes Coutinho back in straight away and blah, 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 he's, he's going to be a hypocrite because of the way he treated Sarko. But I think... They are two very different situations. The Sarko stuff yeah. was very much based on, from what we're led to believe, behaviour. He was very disruptive. He was turning mm-hmm. up late for meetings and meals and stuff like that. Whereas, what? Well, yeah, and the accumulation. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah. and what we're talking about with Coutinho is okay. Yeah, the timing was stupid. You know, it was a bit of a dickhead move to hand a transfer request in. You know, on the eve of the season. But in terms of what it was about, is it was, a, it was a, a move to his dream club. So. There's two diff- very different situations and the talent. Okay, I, I like Sarko. I don't think he's a he's a bad player at all. I did really like him actually. I rated him. <laughs> but we're talking about also one of the best players in the Premier League. <laughs> There's no chance we're gonna say, yeah, go and sit in the stands, go and train with the reserves and so on. So he'll come yeah. straight back in. Yeah, the top players can sort of get away with yeah. things, can't they? Like, well, look, if Ronaldo, Suarez has got yeah. ten, he's just yeah. got a five game suspension. And obviously, no, no well, Suarez is a bit chunks out of players, you know, the same with career, and, and no one uh, yeah, exactly. exiles him. Yeah, yeah I completely <laughs> agree different on rules that. For different rules different place. I mean, we said earlier a bit about the Coutinho situation, so it was a bit of a, obviously, a repeat there. But um, I agree, I think it'll be, he'll come back in, but it's going to be after an international break Probably, at least. Probably, yeah. yeah. So next up, at Mike underscore 7 FS and Prene underscore 8 they had very similar questions on Alexander Arnold, so I've sort of bunched these in as a, as a joint question. Uh, first of all, should Trent be our starting right back even when Klein is back from injury, or could you see him in a role in the centre of midfield where he started out obviously in the academy? Uh, personally, I've been so impressed with his fullback performances. I want him to sort of sustain that role and develop. Uh, but what do you think, lads? I think we've got to see more of yeah Trent first because he's at the a few good games, but I think the free kick is a similar situation to what Burns goal against Leeds last season. Everyone kind of got carried away, and eventually it led to nothing, really. So I also think it's a bit unfair to Klein, who's put in pretty solid 7 out of 10 performances throughout his Liverpool career. So I can see him coming back in and then sort of cop evaluating the situation from there. But at the moment, we haven't seen enough of Trent, I don't think. Yeah, I like I like, I like, I like Trent. Yeah. I th- he's been he's been very solid. He's been he's performed better than what I expected actually. To be fair, um, I seen him come in obviously towards the yeah. end of last season, and I, there were certain games where I thought he was out of his depth. Um, the Man United game in Europa, in particular, I thought Martial um, running riot, uh, running ragged at one stage. Um, he done well to compose himself in the same game, yeah. and he finished it quite strong. To be fair to him, but um, yeah, like Inverter said, I'd like to see a little bit more of him. I want to see that he can be consistent. Klopp's already come out and said as well that he needs to um, develop defensively. I think he's great going forward because um, I think he's, like you said, in, in the academy, he's got plays a bit more of an attacking role down that right-hand side as well as playing through the centre on occasions. But um, yeah, um, Klein's been solid for us. He un- Until like Klein is maybe consider- uh, struggling consistently with injury or he puts in a few bad performances, then... Um, You've got to kind of stick with him as first choice for now, and I think you know with the pressure on Trent at such a young age to kind of be performing consistently, it's probably a little bit too early. I think Klopp will be really clever in how he uses him. You'll bring him into the team, he'll protect him and give him good runs in the cup as well. So I think he'll use him um, consistently, but without too much pressure at the same time. It'll be a see Gomez mm. coming into the equation, so because obviously he played the right back on the weekend, kept the clean sheet. Pretty solid display overall, so is that another option? Yeah. I could see them drafting in Gomez at centre back possibly. I mean the way Lovren yeah, the road that Lovren's suited. going down. Um I wouldn't throw Gomez in just yet, but 
I could see the rotation coming. Obviously, if we get into the Champions League, he's going to need to be playing Gomez uh, either in Premier League or Cup competitions if he wants to put his best team out in the Champions League. Contesting with midweek football, so we haven't done it for you know a you know we didn't have it last season especially. We went out the cups fairly early, so looking at that, I think Gomez could get a role at centre back. Um, but I can see the Klein and Alexandra Arnold rotation happening more often. Like um, Ty said, it'll be a consistent rotation for them too. But Gomez is isn't going to appear in the same. Yeah. Sort of bracket, I feel as as Arnold, but he'll definitely get a, a good run in at centre back. So who's who's everyone's first choice right back at the moment then? Right now, if you had to pick, Klein. Yeah, Klein. Same. <laughs> I'm glad we're all on the same page. <laughs> right, yeah. so okay, maybe that will change, or no? Yeah, it Just could always change. Account. We've we've only seen what is it two games now of Alexander? Yeah. Is it two or three? Three. Mm. Did he play against Palace, or am I dreaming? He didn't play no, against Palace, did he? Gomez, Gomez played yeah. Right back yeah, so we've seen two games of him, so I feel like it's not fair to judge that against how many games Klein's had yeah. for us. Uh, yeah, when well, I'd fun. say, obviously, when we get maybe about eight, ten games out of Alexander-Arnold, then it's maybe best to make a call, but not until then, I would say. Uh, finally, though, at Matty Bradfield, uh, Brayfield actually asked quite a good question, I thought. Uh, where do Liverpool fans hope slash expect to see the club in May 2018? What should the minimum we aim for uh, be during this season? Now, I'm a notorious pessimist, so I'm thinking we'll be about fifth in the league, maybe a cup run and getting out of the Champions League group stage, but I don't see any trophies in the pipeline for us. Uh, the lack of depth's really going to ruin our chances, in my opinion. Uh, what do you think, then, Naz? So we'll have like a hope and an expectation from both of you, if that's all right. All right, I'll go first. And... and... In the league, I think we'll finish fourth. Champions League, I can see us being a surprising team and getting to the semi final. And also, I say, League Cup. So, League, league Cup win, yeah? Just a little bit more yeah. optimistic than a win, then. <laughs> I'm not, okay, no. I am a pessimist. Realistically. <laughs> well, we're talking, we're talking to the guy who has, um, no. predicted us fifth or sixth and United champions, so uh, I'm not going to listen to Owen. <laughs> Um, for me, I think we should be looking to consolidate um, top four. Um, I want to be that team who's consistently in the Champions League so we can attract that better calibre of player. I don't want us to kind of be in there, in and out, in and out, in and out, so teams kind of bypass us and want to be signing for like the likes of Chelsea who are always there or thereabouts. So I think anything in top four I'd be happy with in the league. Um, I think we should be looking at a cup now. Um, we, we should be. We need to be kicking on for like an FA Cup or a League Cup for sure. Um, Liverpool are a team associated with winning trophies not so much in, in recent times but we need to be there obviously we got close very very close we could we could have had Europa and the League Cup in one season so I think yeah. we need to be there um, lifting the cup very soon this is Klopp's what third season now so I think I think he would be yeah, looking exactly. to um, add some silverware now so um, Champions League I think I think we can get to the knockout rounds. It depends on how our group goes. We've said this a couple of times already. I think if we get a favourable group, then on our on our day we can um, be a challenge for anyone. So, I would say I'll predict if we have a kind group, I think we'll go quarters. Mhm. Mm I think that's a, a solid one. Obviously, inverted, you were going to go with a more was it a more sort of uh, an expectation, maybe like a more realistic one. What were you going to say on that one? Well. Realistically, I do think we'll get out of the group stages. I can't see us not finishing in the top four because we've sort of got to progress and consolidate on what we've achieved last season. And then I'm actually hopeful of a cup because obviously everyone loves Klopp, but he's got to sort of show that he's capable of winning yeah. trophies in his career because we can't all just love him for, for his silly jokes <laughs> and his press conferences. He's got to <laughs> show that he's, <laughs> that he's able to win trophies and sort of make a stand out in England. Yeah, I mean, I don't know if you saw the thumbs up in uh, the press conference today <laughs> when he was asked yeah. if Coutinho was coming back into the squad. He just literally just put two <laughs> thumbs up. <laughs> I, I don't know yeah. what goes on in his head, but you know, it's brilliant. It's brilliant to have him in charge, obviously. Um, yeah. Is there any more to add uh, before I finish off, boys? Yeah, change your prediction of United champions, please. <laughs> <laughs> right, so far, I know the media gets carried away, but they have been good, haven't they? Matic has been unreal. 
I don't know if you've watched any United. I've I've had to watch a few to cover for games for uh, ninety minute, but they Matic is is different class. Honestly, I would have loved him at Liverpool. No comment. This, this yeah, I've seen them play. This, but... this is this is a Liverpool podcast, <laughs> though, and I refuse to take part. Oh come on! None of that. <laughs> <laughs> No, but I want no tell this happened with City last season. They won a few games. I think they won the first. Yeah, yeah they did, didn't they? Like, yeah, yeah. City are going to walk the league. A lot happens. They cannot get kind of. They have played West Ham and Swansea. Yeah, they so, played one of the yeah. two I, I worst teams it. in the league so far. So I'm definitely not getting <laughs> carried away. I still give them a challenge on the weekend. I'm, I'm still calling it. I'm still and and calling it, to I'm be sorry. fair, actually, I, I was watching the Swansea United game, and the first 20 minutes, Swansea were the better team. They actually had United on the ropes. They could have easily taken the lead, and then that's a different game, in my mm. opinion. So, yeah, it's, yeah. Uh, who was your call for the to win the league in Verta? Was it City, if I remember? Yeah, yeah. I think City. Yeah. You two both went I City, think so, didn't yeah. you? I'm just trying to I dodge. Think it. They got the best, the best F in the league, <laughs> and got the older, obviously. You're just dodging the truth. That's what it is. They're gonna do it. We're all gonna have a cry. <laughs> is, is, is this like <laughs> undercover? Are you like a secret you, closet yeah. United fan? Yeah, this, yeah. This I'm actually I'm closet the, yeah. closet fan. <laughs> Can you imagine if we just came out? I was like, nah, I actually support United. Yeah, it's just all banter. <laughs> I think I'd be, I'd be burnt at the stake, possibly. By me. <laughs> By type. <laughs> <laughs> right. So yeah, we get to do the next yeah. podcast on that one. Just names it. Yeah. <laughs> special. <laughs> Right, so that's all we have time for today. I hope you all enjoyed the longer podcast and obviously the jokes of me being a United fan, of course. Uh, <laughs> that's the uh, only one we'll have out this week, unfortunately. We'll be back, uh, I think, next Thursday, uh, the 31st of August. So where can the listeners find you off the podcast, lads? Ty? Ty underscore talks LFC and my personal one is Tyrone underscore PT. Mine's at Invertibility on Twitter. Awesome. So, so be uh, sure to give them a follow. Once again, follow at Anfield Edition for updates on when the podcast is released and to ask us your questions, of course. Thank you to everyone that submitted questions this week. We had a really good response from what I saw on Twitter. So that was awesome to see that just come in. Pleasure talking to you lads as always. So say goodbye, Ty. Cheers, guys. Don't forget to follow Owen Zona as well. I don't want to give him abuse of being a Closet yes. United fan. Go on, go for it. I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm all ears. Just go for it. <laughs> and say goodbye, Inverter. Yeah, thanks for listening, everybody. Okay, and it's bye for me as well. <laughs>